Delighted to be joined by Ambassador David Quarry, who um, has just one week left of his right. term in, uh, in Israel. I really want to just start by just asking you what you feel is the situation now with the uh, UK-Israel relationship. There's been a lot of things that have expanded, prospered, grown. Well, what, what would you say are the sort of main things that have really, really developed in your time here? Well, I think the UK-Israel relationship is now deeper and broader than it's ever been before. And we see that particularly on the economic side, that we've had three consecutive years of record trade levels, hitting $10 billion for the first time last year. Uh, We've seen increased uh, Israeli investment in the UK. We've got 340 Israeli companies operating that we know of now in the UK. We've seen a big expansion of our science cooperation and huge things going on in in the tech world. So it's a really positive picture on the economic side. But with lots happening on on other issues like security cooperation as well. We don't talk about all the details in public, but uh, there is more cooperation happening between the two countries now, again, than I think there's ever been before. So I think the uh, UK-Israel relationship is in very good health right now. From what you've seen of that that really expanding trade relationship, what what do you think is driving that? Are there particular sectors? Is there something unique about that marriage of minds between British and Israeli businesses? What do you see that's driving it? One of the encouraging things for me is that it's Mm broad-based. It's not just all about tech or it's Mm -hmm. not all about particular areas of, of tech or... We've had our biggest ever sort of classic export deal uh, in my time here with the £1 billion deal with Rolls-Royce uh, air engines for El Al. So that's a sort of classic uh, British export. We've also seen amazing partnerships developing uh, in the tech world. We're seeing a big expansion at the moment around uh, healthcare. Mm. All kinds of work, some sort of pure science, a lot around tech, a lot of companies here wanting to get into the UK market and help bring these extraordinary innovations in healthcare from Israel to the National Health Service. So as I say, it's, a, it's an encouraging thing for me that it's not all about one thing, uh, it's, it's broad-based. And I think particularly, a lot of Israelis find the UK uh, a very attractive place to live and to work and to do business. Mm. And for Israelis looking to take their business to a European or even a global market, London and the UK uh, is a brilliant platform for them. Mm. And there's a really good cultural fit, I think. I hear a lot of Israelis saying how much they love the UK, how they feel very at home there, the culture works for them, the language works, the time zones and all those things. So it's, it's a good fit between the two countries. Mm. In, in terms of the, the UK relationship, I, I, it's an interesting one because there's sometimes a feeling, particularly with what's going on at home with Brexit and, and what's going on with, with UK foreign policy generally, like, there's always this question of, you know, does Britain matter? What influence can we have? What role can we have? Could you, could you reflect a bit on, like, when you're here in Israel as a British ambassador, does, does it feel that, that Britain's voice is important? Are there ways that Britain has a really important influence between what's going on in Israel? Yeah, I mean, I think we're, we're a valued partner for Israel. And I was struck, I think it was in sort of 2017, 18, Prime Minister Netanyahu went to London three times in eight mm. months, which must be a record mm. uh, to have a head of government going to London three times with that kind of frequency. Partly because there's a lot of great stuff to celebrate, all the economic things we've been talking about, but also because we're important partners for each other on regional and international issues. Mm. Doesn't mean we agree with Israel on everything. We've got our differences on some policy issues. But we see each other as important partners to have those kinds of discussions with, including at the very top levels uh, between the prime ministers. So I think this is an important relationship for Israel. And I think many Israelis see us as their number one natural partner in Europe. And and that's important for us too. Is is there anything you want to say about in terms of as you're leaving? What what do you think are the the big challenges that Israel now faces and the things that in terms of the the Britain-Israel relationship, what might be the stresses, what might be the concerns about what's happening in the future? Well, for me, you know, it's uh, one of the, the most disappointing things, one of the few really sort of big disappointing things of my four years here mm. is that we've just seen no progress toward peace between Israel and, and the Palestinians. And uh, I think that's bad for people on the ground here. We've seen you know, repeated speak, uh, peaks of uh, violence. Uh, it's also bad because there is this enormous opportunity, I think, for Israel at the moment to transform its relationship with the Arab world. Mm. Now, some things have have clearly been happening on that already, but it will never achieve its full potential, that relationship, unless there is 
real progress on the Palestinian issue. So I think there's a very big prize to be gained, but it can't be realised. Well, there's no progress. Mm. And US plan potentially going to be published soon. Did, did, any thoughts about whether you think that that will kick off some kind of new phase or whether that's potentially going to go in a different direction? We've been very clear with the Americans that we want their plan to succeed. Mm. You know, it, we do not think it is good for there to be no political dialogue, no political activity aimed at moving the issues forward. So we hope they'll succeed. You hear very different views here about the prospects uh, for the plan, but I think we've all got an interest in uh, seeing the plan come out and then hopefully it providing a foundation for, for progress because yeah, partly things could get worse, but partly also there's a big opportunity still to be seized if we can find a way to get some kind of political process moving again. Mm. And just finally, I mean, could you share maybe some highlights of your visit here? I mean, there have been some fantastic moments, a lot of visits, but, you know, we had the first royal visit, which was, I saw some of that myself, and it was, it was brilliantly handled, if I can say, by, by the team here and by yourself. Uh, any other real highlights or even that one you want to reflect on? Yeah, I mean, I th- there have been a number of, I think the three big highlights for me as I look back. First of all, receiving Prince Charles, the chief rabbi, Boris Johnson, David Cameron, Tony Blair for the Shimon Peres funeral. Mm -hmm. And the the Peres funeral was an extraordinarily moving moment Mm -hmm. for for those of us who were lucky enough to be there. Because it was really a celebration of of an incredible life. Mm -hmm. And to see uh, so many people coming, you know, the most senior members of the international community coming to pay tribute to Mm -hmm. that life. And there was something very special and emotional about that moment. I think Lord Rothschild's Balfour dinner in yeah. London really was a moment. And I can remember as we walked into the, to the room at Lancaster House that night, just, yeah, it was a fabulous event. And you could really pe- hear people's breath being taken away by mm. who was there, how beautiful the whole thing was. And I thought uh, Theresa May spoke brilliantly about the UK-Israel relationship uh, mm. that night. So the, the Balfour centenary was another moment. But really the, the royal visit, Prince William's visit, was the, the highlight. And I can vividly remember standing at the bottom of the steps, mm. waiting for him to exit the aeroplane, standing next to colleagues from the Israeli government. And we could all feel that this was a, a historic moment. Mm. You could really sense that on the day. And uh, it took an unbelievable amount of preparation, that visit. But I think people in Israel really responded to how much Prince William enjoyed the visit and how we really wanted to get a feel for the country, not just go from meeting to meeting, but actually to get out and touch the country. And I hope we enabled him to do that. And I continue to get the most fantastic positive feedback from Israelis about what that visit meant to people here. Mm. And so it was a real privilege to be to be part of that. Yeah, it really shows how the royal family is able to kind of reach parts that the politicians exactly. can't reach. Exactly. Yeah. Well, Ambassador Quarry, thank you so much for your time and also thank you for all, all the work that you've done and uh, yeah, I wish you best of luck with your next job. Thanks. It's been an incredible experience for us, both personally and professionally. So we're just very grateful to have had the opportunity. I am uh, here on the Lebanese border in Israel. I'm delighted to be joined by the IDF spokesman, Lieutenant Colonel Jonathan Conricus. Jonathan, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. So I really just wanted to catch up with you to talk about the events of last weekend and this, this, this very significant missile attack by Hamas and Islamic Jihad. If you could just share with me some of your thoughts about sort of the nature of that attack and wh- why perhaps it was different from, from previous situations. The different thing was that this time it wasn't Hamas who dictated events, but rather a smaller organization, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, I'll refer to it as PAJ, henceforth, and they were the ones who we saw in our intelligence that they were trying quite desperately over a period of a few weeks to execute different attacks. Unfortunately, they succeeded in in executing one attack, and it was a sniper attack where they had a sniper embedded with between rioters rather or using rioters along the fence on a Friday who then fired at Israeli officers and was unfortunately able to wound uh, one officer quite severely and one lightly, an Israeli soldier. That triggered a a response from the IDF which then Hamas decided to uh, attack again against Israel but this time firing rockets together with the PIJ 
at Israeli civilians, the sum total of more than 700 rockets over a period of roughly 48 hours fired from all parts of Gaza towards many cities in southern Israel. Furthermost north was Ashdod and furthermost east was uh, Beersheba. So essentially within the roughly 40 kilometer range with more than a million and a half of Israeli civilians in that range and as I said 700 rockets. Now the good part of that ugly picture is that approximately 100 out of those 700 fired didn't even make it cross the uh, Gaza Strip and landed inside the Gaza Strip and we've also heard reports that they caused damage and damage and casualties inside Gaza. Out of those that crossed the vast majority landed and exploded in open terrain and those that we needed to intercept that were destined to impact in Israeli populated areas uh, were quite successfully intercepted by the Iron Dome. Uh, the success rate was about 80, uh, 86% uh, which is quite phenomenal thinking of the challenge, the quantities and the size of the area that our Iron Dome batteries had to defend. However, and if I'll summarize and again go back to the beginning of the question you asked what was different, the amount, the massive amount of 700 rockets, the short time frame, the coordinated fire between Hamas and the PIJ, and most significantly and sadly so, the death of four Israeli civilians. And we haven't had that in a very long period of time, something that we see as a severe development and an attack on Israeli civilians, which of course forced us to respond in kind and uh, strike military targets inside Gaza. Was there something about what Hamas and uh, PIJ were trying to do that they were they were actually trying to focus fire very heavily on on perhaps you know a few targets and by doing that try to overwhelm overwhelm Iron Dome and and were they successful? I mean, you may not be able to elaborate, but it looked like they were successful at doing that. I'd actually beg to differ. I think that they definitely tried to yeah. overwhelm the system and outsmart the radars and the interceptors and the personnel who man the system. But at the end of the day, uh, I think that the success rate uh, uh, is... Uh, is proof of the fact that despite massive concentrated fire on specific targets, by the way, fire that was uh, rockets that were fired from different locations. So we had rockets that were fired from south, central and northern part of Gaza almost simultaneously towards the same Israeli uh, town or city, which is a challenge in terms of the traje trajectory uh, of the rockets. Uh, at the end of the day, the overwhelming majority of the rockets were intercepted. Unfortunately, a few got through. We're still in, obviously learning the lessons. Key point being for civilians, for Israeli civilians to be disciplined and to be very aware of and act according to the instructions given by the Israeli Home Front Command because those save lives. Mm -hmm. If all other layers of defense are not successful, then at the end of the day, if you're in a bomb shelter, nothing will happen. Uh, sure, there will be an explosion, but you will not get, uh, get hurt. I just wanted to ask about the story about uh, there was, a, I think, a pregnant Palestinian woman and a, and a baby. And initially there was a report that they'd been killed in Israeli airstrike. And then I think the IDF and yourself announced, according to your information, that that was from a, a misfiring of a missile or a missile landing shore. And I think that, that was a very interesting point in terms of what was happening and also how quickly these things can be investigated and verified. You might not be able to provide us with a lot of detail, but I wondered if you'd just give us a bit of an insight into the efforts that go into checking on incidents like that and how important it is to then put that information out to try and ascertain what exactly has happened. Right. Well, dealing with organizations, terrorist organizations like Hamas, who are media savvy and constantly seek to uh, leverage tragic events on the ground for political purposes. They do so and have been doing so for many years using very cynically everything that comes uh, at hand, civilians, women, children. Uh, they've used civilians, Gazan civilians now along the fence really as props, mm. sending them forward urging civilians, Gazan civilians, to try to dismantle the fence, to try to get into Israel, knowing very well that it's an exercise in futility and that they, Hamas, are exposing Gazan civilians to mortal danger. 
but they do so willingly because they want the horrible pictures in in western media they want the outcry they want people around the world to say and feel sorry about the palestinians and i as a as a human being yes i feel sorry for gazans as well i wouldn't like to live in the conditions that they live in but re responsibility lies with hamas and with none other Specifically for this case, this uh, incident, another example of attempt by Hamas to peddle fake news and to disinform the world about what was happening. They claimed that it was an Israeli strike. Since we saw that Western media was picking up on it and it were really feeding into the uh, uh, Hamas uh, narrative here, we investigated it and found out rather quickly that it was indeed improper use of Palestinian ordinance, we'll put it at that, that led to the unfortunate and very sad outcome of uh, a mother and a child, a baby, uh, being, uh, being killed. But we wanted to get our rebuttal out as fast as possible and as clear as possible and to say on record and we did so uh, clearly uh, my uh, boss the idf spokesperson brigadier general manelis said so on record and then i uh, repeated that that it was not an israeli strike and that it was as a result of uh, of uh, uh, palestinian weapons yeah. an unfortunate incident but again an, an example a sad example of uh, similar to other events where hamas is willing to stop at nothing in order to gain points and uh, to try to uh, libel israel the idf and uh, to spread fake news just another question, just, just changing tack really slightly, um, to talk about Iran in Syria. I've heard in some, some places that, that there is a, maybe a sense now that Iran is perhaps slightly uh, decreasing its presence in Syria, that given Israeli operations over the last couple of years, that they are potentially realizing that they are sort of scaling down, maybe that's financial pressures within, within Iran, or whether it's because they've realized that they need to change approach because, because Israel uh, has, has been successful at, at hitting their forces in Syria. I wondered if you want to say anything about that? Well, as we speak, a lot is being said and written about Iran and their expansionist attempts in the Middle East, where, whether it is Iraq, Syria, Yemen. Uh, so, of course, I'll be careful with what I say. But in general, if we look back at activities, we, we know that the Iranians had a plan to entrench themselves militarily in Syria to establish forward operating bases, to have airfields of their own and to have loyal troops comprised of militias, Hezbollah, terrorists and uh, Syrian forces on the ground uh, to the size of approximately 100,000. That was the Iranian goal. Um, and they also were aiming to establish a naval port. Today, the situation is quite different and the Iranians are far, far from their intended plans, uh, underachieving uh, grossly. Uh, one of the reasons, perhaps uh, the main contributor, has been our firm response where we met our words with action and uh, we have been targeting uh, intentionally that Iranian entrenchment in Syria, responding to it and trying to limit it uh, by mostly kinetic means led by the Air Force but based on, on uh, very good and updated intelligence. At the end of the day there have been three attacks over the last year where Iranian forces, proper Iranian forces belonging to the Revolutionary Guard Quds Force attacked Israel once on the 10th of February 2018 second event on the 10th of May and then in late December where they violated Israeli sovereignty either with UAVs or with rockets we were able to stop those attacks and respond immediately against Iranian inf military infrastructure in Syria so it's still an ongoing process the Iranians we know are long-term uh, players they have an expansionist and a hostile agenda towards Israel they are almost a thousand kilometers away from their borders and the question begs to be answered what are they doing here we know what we want to do we want to defend our sovereignty and our civilians and we are very determined to continue to do so and to use whatever means necessary in order to implement that goal lieutenant colonel conricus thank you so much for joining us thank you very much a pleasure to be here